Hello, and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. This week, our guests are historian and Princeton professor Sean Wilentz and foreign policy expert and journalist Indira Lakshmanan. Now, remember, we love taking your questions, so write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, but don't forget to tell us where you're from. And please check out the links to our sponsors, Songfinch, Stellar Sleep, and Naked Wines in our episode show notes. We thank you for supporting our sponsors. It really helps make this podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, James, the Trump cult, a.k.a. the Republican Party, gets nuttier and really more disgraceful by the day. Just here, here are some lowlights. Texas Rep Chip Roy, sometimes depicted as the more reasonable uh, and rational of the right-wing caucus in the House, that's like being the brightest bear in the zoo, I guess, said the state of Texas should ignore a Supreme Court ruling that the federal role in the border case takes precedence over state action. This is really analogous to the old nullification theory before the Civil War. Ignore the Supreme Court. I don't like a lot of Supreme Court decisions, but you don't ignore them. I mean, Chip Roy ought to go look at Al Gore's speech in December of 2000. Uh, 2000. There are serious efforts by a handful of Republicans to hammer out a border compromise. It's really an awful issue. The compromise is they're, they're putting together actually gives Republicans much of what they supposedly want in return for more assistance for Ukraine and Israel. But House Speaker Mike Johnson, sight unseen, said the measure was dead on arrival in the House. That was orders from Berlin, or in this case, Mar-a-Lago. Trump said, kill it. Johnson said Trump had nothing to do with this. Hasn't the super religious Louisiana read the biblical admonition against bearing false witness? I mean, it really is just outrageous. And one of the immigration negotiators, Senator Lankford of Oklahoma, James, we've had him on this show, and you know he is a stalwart and honest conservative. He was censured by the nutbags who lead the Oklahoma Republican Party for even deigning to talk about uh, a border deal. And finally, uh, again, at the, the directions of the Capo de Capi, I think I've got that right now, the mob's boss of boss, uh, the House Republicans are moving to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The grounds for that, for the first impeachment of a cabinet secretary in 148 years, the grounds are it'll help us politically and it'll please the Don. It, it really is an act of lawless vigilantes. It's opposed by almost any respectable conservatives, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, and even the MAGA-loving, media-crazy GW law professor Jonathan Turley says there's nothing impeachable here. James, this is just, it gets worse. Well, Al, uh, you're a great guy, very experienced. Uh, You're somewhat quaint. You still have the ability to be outraged. This is like, in terms of their insanity, it's medium, maybe up, up a medium level. I mean, all you got to do is look at the Taylor Swift stuff. Hey, wait a minute, there's a lot of them saying that the NFL games are rigged. You got you got Vivek Ramsawamy. Remember him? He was the guy with the Ivy League degree yeah. and was a tech pro. They have left crazy a long, long time ago. That 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 that's so far in their rearview mirror, you can't imagine it. And let me tell you, this stuff is going to go on and on and on and on, and it it's just where we are. I, it, there's no other explanation for it. And of course, Langford's a Old line conservative uh, went to Bible college, uh, was trying to hammer something out with Chris Murphy, who's also been on this show, I might add. And the idea that this is something remotely connected to policy, the idea that this is somehow remotely connected to the rule of law, is that's gone. That's in the rearview mirror. That's it dust. Is. It is. And, and, it just is. 
it, they, they it, it, now it's it's Taylor Swift. Who in the fuck knows what it's going to be two months from now? And how do you even, if you're asked to comment on this, I, what, what can you say? You just so you it's so crazy. You're you're flummoxed. You're, you're flummoxed that that Roger Goodell and and CBS and some I don't know ESPN and the Athletic are, are all in in the show promoters and the, the Jews in Hollywood or ever have this whole thing rigged. Well, let me, let me, let me. Fuck, let me this is not a fringe thing. No, no <laughs> everything they do is beyond fringe. Uh, when the Oklahoma Republican Party decided to, to, to censure Jim Langford, the conservative senator, just for the mere act of sitting down, it was one of the leaders was uh, State Senator Dusty Devers. I looked at Dusty Devers' record. He wants to. He has proposed a bill that would imprison anyone who looks at pornography, who looks at por- any pornography dealing with sexual intercourse or masturbation or any other stimulation, a, at least a year in prison. I just hope that State Senator Devers doesn't have a teenage son. I really pray that he, he doesn't. <laughs> well, hate to visit your son in prison. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd want to add... You, you forget that Mike Johnson has covenant eyes. Uh, he has a teenage son, and he spies on his computer habits. If we're going to get into to, 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 to Mike Johnson later in the show. you got to understand, this level of insanity permeates... This is not fringe. This is mainline shit that is in real danger of becoming dominant forces in, in, in the government of the United States. That's that's my entire message here. It, it seems funny to us. It seems funny to me. It seems funny that you're going to arrest someone for, for jerking off. Shit. Watch out. They're not very far from taking well, over. Dusty Devers, I guess, would arrest Mike Johnson and his kid. I mean, uh, it, it really could be a, be a civil war within the nutbacks. You know, James, uh, on a more uh, serious they, note, I think the Republicans uh, may be making a huge miscalculation in killing any immigration compromise because it gives them basically what they've asked for. And I think for the, I think Biden is in terrible shape on the border. He just is. I mean, for whatever reason, uh, they 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 just ha- just haven't measured up. It's an issue that cuts not just in the border states, but they've been sending these migrants to New York and Illinois and Massachusetts, and it cuts there too. I think Biden has a chance now to say, "Hey, here's what we wanted to do. This is exactly what we wanted to do." Some of the left doesn't like this at all, but this is what we wanted to do to give authority to stop this. And guess what? They decided for political reasons because they were ordered by the Don not to do it. I don't know that it's a winning issue for Biden, but I tell you, he has at least a chance to minimize his losses on it. So let's say today is, uh, what, January the 30th? Yeah, the end of the month. Something like that. The end of the month. All right, let, let's, let's wait in the first poll in April, and let's see how on border security of Biden's numbers are up. Uh, I, I hope you're right. I don't think it matters. I mean, of course, he has, he has the, the, the high ground. He's the political high ground. He's the, the policy high ground. He has anything. Uh, watch Fox and Newsmax and talk radio. It, it If it moves three points, I, 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 I'll, I'll be well, shocked. Well, there's nothing else. That's, but there's there's sure. nothing else that's going to move it. Nothing. I'm not sure it'll move or not. But I think it gives, first of all, Biden has almost nothing he can talk about at the border. He just can't even talk about it because it's gotten so bad. And uh, I, largely, I don't think it's all his fault. But this at least gives him something to talk about, which. You know, it gives him something to talk I, I Look, I'm not, I, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I have, you know, maybe I'll get it back. I, I have just lost faith in people's ability to discern hypocrisy, uh, goofiness, uh, anything like that. I, I, I'm sure I'll snap out of this funk I'm in. But, of course, you know, Langford and, and Murphy and 
everybody starts with the premise that this is a legit deal. There, there, there's some people who think we have to have really hard border policies. Other people think we should have more closer to open borders that we're going to support. A, it's not even remotely a legit deal to these people. Not remotely. And I don't, I don't think their voters really cared. And I, if you turn on the talk radio today, Mark Levin will be screaming at the top of his freaking voice. And that they're not, it's just not, it's just a different world. I'm, I don't know how to say it, but it's just a different world. I, 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 I would love to be wrong. I'd love to come back well, and say, wrong. you know, Al, you know, I don't know if it's, a, it's not really an argument. It, it's just a, we, we live in a world where events really matter to anything. Or is it just all this, how freaking nutty? Chris Roy, about Chip Roy worked for Ted Cruz. He kind of came up through the Texas, you know, Republican hierarchy. And, He's not. He's not even considered to be in the top twenty-five. Honestly, close. He may have made the top thirty. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm too depressed trying to think of. But he he's not a, at the Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Bobbitt, Clay Higgins, Andy Gosar, Ralph Norman. We could go on for a long time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he's, he's he's got he, he's got a lot of work to do when he wants to break into that crowd. But imagine saying, let's let's just ignore the Supreme Court. Texas is Texas law uh, is uh, is superior. I mean, that really is. I mean, we fought a war over that uh, about a hundred and. Uh, 60 years ago, uh, but that's where number 28 in the list of uh, house crazies comes yeah, in. Not totally you know, I, I do think that the, I, I also think that the impeachment of Mayorkas could backfire. It could backfire in the sense not there's a whole Mayorkas uh, uh, caucus a out there, but it's, you know, if I'm a Democrat running in New York or if I'm running, I mean, there's a number of Republicans like Ken Buck who have said, you know, there's nothing impeachable here. Uh, and 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 there are others, and that timid twenty-one that we talk about, uh, the members from New York and California, and a couple from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I mean, they say they're sent. They say they came to Washington to try to legislate and do important things, conservative things. They said, if instead the argument is all they want to do is not do anything but engage in ridiculous impeachments, I I, I don't know. I I, I think it's. Uh, it, it's something they have to worry about a little bit. Most of them, no. But that that timid, the ones who won by one percent, and I, they're they're, they're not going to campaign on. Guess what we did? We impeached well, the Homeland I, Security Secretary. Uh, so I think we're going to win New York three. Uh, there is really not much evidence that we going to take the house back right now. I'm sorry. It just well, isn't. that's because it's nine months out. And, you know, uh, see a lot again, I, 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 Losing I, I, New York I, I, 3 would be that, a leading indicator that you're not going to take back the house. Uh, so, they, I think they're going to lose it. But, the, you, you know, yeah, no, no, no. Got no, a lot first of all, James, let, me give, con strong. let me give context. New York 3 is the seat that was held by George Santos, who was then uh, kicked out of the house. And uh, the former congressman, Democrat right. government, is trying to, trying to win it back. We're going to win that, but there is very little evidence that we're a favorite to win the House back. But I hope I'll, look, things can change. I, I, I don't know, but I got to tell you, uh, it, it, this should hurt. It's idiotic. It's stupid on every level. Uh, I mean, how is Trump ahead of Biden after everything else, after after inciting a freaking riot, after God knows every kind of crime you can commit? Including rape. Being adjudicated, rape, rape, business fraud. And, you know, we just got to keep plugging away. But there's precious little evidence that any of this stuff shakes you know, and then you got, you know, my thing is we, we'll just normalize it. We'll say, well, they're going to have their view and you have your view and people will determine what 
the vision for the country is come November. <laughs> well, we'll talk to Sean Lorenz about that uh, well, well. later. Uh, look, uh, nothing may change. Nothing has changed in the past, uh, right. although we did lose in 2020. Uh, but I, you know, I think accumulation of things. Uh, most people are unaware. I, I teach a class of really smart college students, and I asked them last week, how many people here know that Trump was convicted of what the judge called clearly rape? And only two out of 27 hands went up. So, I mean, some of it, people are going to find out more. They're going to know more. We'll see what happens with any of these criminal trials that are held. Uh, I don't think the situation looks great right now, but uh, I think they have more at risk. I think the only thing the Democrats really have at risk is Biden's health. Uh, that's a big one. But uh, I think the Republicans have at least more at risk uh, over the next nine months. But we'll see. You, know, you, you very well could be right. In your projection as of now, there's extraordinary little evidence of it. There's a, some, there is considerable effort, evidence that Dobbs has really put them in a box. That is the one thing that I, 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 I know for sure. They've been politically hurt, clock by Dobbs. I, and all this other crazy shit. Uh, how did somebody be in it? I, I'm just, just kind of curious. I know you, you teach it at a, at a first-rate institution. How in the fuck could you not know about E. Jean Carroll and what well, happened? It wasn't that, no, what no, kind no, of no, bubble no, no, they no, live no, no, in? It wasn't they didn't know about E. Jean Carroll. It's just that the whole, you know, the, the, the fact that the way it was covered and the fact that it's covered on Tuesday and then forgotten on Wednesday. They weren't aware that it was rape. They thought, oh, yeah, he was convicted of some kind of sexual indiscretion against him. But what it was was it was a civil trial and statute, so you couldn't officially be charged of rape. But the judge said what he was convicted of is tantamount to rape. Right. And uh, so that, all right, that's where our friend, this is, for my, this is me, I thought people, Trump cannot be normalized. It, whenever he's covered, it's me, Donald John Trump, comma, an adjudicated rapist in business fraud, comma, said today, blank. But when, because it's not to cover something once, and, and this is a very, very, very thing that happens, and I see this all the time. Well, James, we've already covered yeah. that. Well, when you got... 26 out of 28 kids at a first-rate American university that don't realize that maybe you maybe you haven't covered it enough. All right, that that that's where normalization comes in. I'm not blaming these children for. No, no, I agree. But it, but it's it's, it's, it's oh, you know yeah, there's a future shock here. He does something. He does so many despicable things. He does something on Monday, uh, and then on Tuesday he does something else. So you forget about what he did on Monday. And I think it's a great challenge for uh, for the media and for the Democrats uh, to to more to make a more effective case uh, than they have so far. But we will see. Okay. You know, take your Valentine's Day given to the next level. Sunfinch will take you beyond the next level. You go from single A. To major leagues, you don't have to stop in double A or triple A. Valentine's Day is coming. You know, I got two daughters, I got a wife, and the, you know, normally if a lot of people do the same thing. Oh, shit, I'm in the CVS, I'm in the Walmart, and you got some Hallmark of, I don't know, Godiva candies maybe, and, and get some of that, and then you give it to them, and they go, oh, Daddy, thank you so much. Oh, honey, that's so thoughtful of you. Fuck that. Nothing ever happens to it. No one remembers it. It's another pair of socks at, at Christmas. And, and you know, you, if you just think about it, you're going to get some, you know, maybe if you're in a particularly good mood, you'll send some flowers. All right. And, and it, it, the people get candy, they get flowers all the time. This is the personal touch. This is almost Clintonian in its concept. That it's, it's just not like shaking hands and walking past. It's stopping actually listening to what you have to say and looking you in the eye and being sort of in touch with people. And, and you know, I, I think something like this, and this is a really, a, I think, a stunningly creative, effective, and, and kind of almost romantic way to use technology. I'm, my hat's off to these yeah. guys. Uh, you know, and you're right. Valentine's Day is right around the corner. 
and flowers and chocolates. Uh, they're nothing new. With Songfinch, you can gift an unforgettable memory. Songfinch is the ultimate gift to show how much you care. You get an original studio-quality song inspired by your story. It's completely unique, personal, and lasts forever. I made, an, I made a Songfinch, or I had Songfinch make a song for my wife, Judy, a couple years ago, and she loved it. It captured how I felt. Um, I can't, much better than I could say it, I'm afraid, and beautifully told the story of how we met. Look, the look she has when she listens to that was priceless. You'll love how Song Finch makes it easy by walking you through a simple four-step process to create an original song. All you have to do is tell them about who the song is for, provide some personal details and the type of song you want, and then pick your favorite Song Finch artist. Or get matched with one. And they'll pour their heart into writing, recording, and producing your original song in just four to seven days. Special add-ons can help to commemorate the occasion even more. There's a vinyl record of your song, one-of-a-kind art based on your lyrics, or adding your song to streaming services so you can surprise your unsuspecting recipient. Songfinch is the only original music platform that guarantees you'll love your song or they'll work with you until you do. They stand behind every original song their community of talented artists creates, over 300,000 of them. So put your heart on the line with a studio-quality song unique to your relationship. It only takes four to seven days, and the song lasts forever. You know, James, I was shocked that our producers were able to come up with a song just for, just for you and me. So here's a clip. To accomplish well-respected men For a limited time, Song Finch is letting our listeners upload their song on Spotify for free so you can listen to your new favorite song anywhere you go. Head to songfinch.com slash warroom and start your song. After your purchase, you'll be prompted to add Spotify streaming for your original song for free. That's a $50 value. This offer is only available for our listeners at our special URL, songfinch.com slash warroom. That's songfinch.com slash warroom. Don't wait. Get started now. You also can find the link in our show notes. Hey, James, we always elevate ourselves when our guest is the eminent Princeton historian, Sean Wilentz. Sean, thank you for joining us again. It's great to have you back. Um, I, 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 we have so much to talk about. But first, your New York Review a books piece on the justification under the 14th Amendment for barring Donald Trump, who orchestrated an insurrection and banned him from the ballot. That argument that you and I talked to Judge Michael Ludig about, I think it's a powerful argument. Yet, and the only person I am more hesitant to disagree with is my wife. Uh, I fear the consequences would be grave, not just the possibility of violence, but for permanent alienation of a large swatch of the electorate. I, I just think it's so much better to, to beat him at the beat him at the ballot box. Yeah, and, and Al, you're not the only person who, who said that that I've heard. And my re response is this: um, We have a constitution. There are rules in that constitution. The constitution is more important than the political outcome. The, the, they are, it is the essence of American democracy. People say, people have said that this will damage people. Uh, many millions of people will have their faith in democracy ruined if Trump is disqualified because they'll think that it is something, it is an, it, it, it negates democracy. Okay. Donald Trump has already tried to negate democracy and come awfully close to doing so. This amendment, this 14th Amendment, and the third section in particular, was placed precisely to protect the republic from that kind of person, that kind of candidate. There are certain things that the electoral process cannot handle. They understood that in the aftermath of the Civil War. They understood that 
as the Confederacy, the defeated Confederacy was trying to undo the great revolution that had just happened, the abolition of slavery. They would stop at nothing. Well, the, the Trump people have already said they will stop at nothing. They are not going to respect the outcome of the, of, of, of the, of the election in November if, the, if it so suits them. They are a clear and present danger to democracy. That's my view. And that's why the framers of that amendment put it there. Um, so you have a choice. Look, you can alienate a lot of people and get them angry and stirred up. All right. We have ways to handle people who are angry and stirred up. Or you can invite Another insurrection. You can invite someone to come into office who has sworn to undo the Constitution when he sees fit. That, to me, is a much greater danger to democracy than anything that would happen out of disqualification. It makes sense, Al? Does that make sense at all? Well, yeah, it does make sense. I'm with you in spirit. I really am. I were, look, I thought Mitch McConnell and Republicans made a huge mistake in 2021 when they could have impeached and convicted Trump and denied him uh, ever running mm -hmm. again. James pointed out, well, they would have lost some elections. It would have been worth it. It would have been worth it. I mean, they'd be in a lot better place today if they lost 10 or 12 House seats in 2022 and a couple Senate seats uh, and not have this evil man around. So I'm with you mm -hmm. uh, and, and as on the argument. I just worry. I'm, I'm, I'm being too shallow on this, Sean. Well, should... but let, let, let's look at it this way, though. Look, these, this base, this fear, this specter has got people scared out of their minds. There's going to be violence. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. Look, this is the United States of America. We have a government. We can handle this kind of thing if they try it. That's, our, that's what we have a government for. Um, you know, insurrectionists should not be allowed to push us around. I'm tired of getting pushed around by these people and by people who are so frightened. Oh, they're quailing in the face of this, this, this Trump base. I don't, I, no, we're the United States of America. We're better than this. And we have a constitution that tells those people they cannot have their candidate because he tried to, you know, incite, an, he did incite an insurrection. I, I, I don't know. I, I just take it that way. I'm sick of having these people, a minority of the population, by the way, push the rest of the country around. That's not the way that America is supposed to work. Well, it's certainly a powerful argument. Sean, you made reference to normal elections. and Is 2024 abnormal, uh, assuming that Trump is on the ballot? And what does that mean? It is completely abnormal. Um, we're not seeing an election. We haven't been seeing an election at all. What we're seeing is a long-running, continuing, rolling coup d'etat. That began in June, at least no, no later than June 20, um, uh, 2020, when Trump first announced that he was not going to abide by the results of the election if he didn't want to. He has not stopped since then. It's been implacable, I say, like the old, you know, defeated Confederates in trying to take power back. What we're seeing then, everything you see out there, these primaries, the Iowa primaries, it's not, it's, it's not, it's nonsense. It's not really a part. There's no election going on, no, no primaries going on. Donald Trump owns that party. There is no Republican Party, any, in fact. The Republican Party died sometime around 2016. It's a cult. We historians, yeah, we historians know, though, that, that parties, common parties go in American history. There's nothing to say that a party's going to last forever. This one died. And it was taken over by, you know, what I call them, you know, it's a cult, but it's the MAGA party. And nothing, nothing emblemizes that better, Al, than the recent um, amicus brief that Ted Cruz and his friends worked up to the court that basically said that, that Donald Trump, among other things, did not engage in an insurrection. Mitch McConnell signed that amicus brief. Here's a man who said in the aftermath, this man committed an insurrection. He is not. They are kowtowing to him entirely. So there is no, there is no Republican Party. There's only Donald Trump. And um, in the face of that, we're not having an, this is not only an abnormal election, it's not an election at all. What we're up against is a, is a running coup d'etat that we have to stop. That's my view. James. So uh, let's play like we're in the classroom. So, Charlotte Lynch, you get an invitation to talk at the National Press Club. And they're all there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is everybody. Yeah. And, yeah. and the question is, how should we cover this? Now, you know, the Peter Baker article was a, 
fountain of conventional wisdom, to, you know, 270 electoral votes, there are two separate Americas out there, and then, of course, they call you at the end, and you say, this is nothing normal about this, <laughs> and you, you've answered it, but what would you tell so that they're all the symbol there, right. the, 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 the slushing, the, the, the whatever, right. you know, so what would you tell so what, 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 how, how should we do this? Huh? Uh, I, exactly what, what I just said, exactly, and I sort of told Peter that, I mean, Peter's a good man, and he's writing his piece, and I told him, I had actually had an earlier interview with him, but look, you can't cover this as a normal election. You cannot run the horse race. You cannot do it that way. I know that's the way you've been trained to do it. I know that's the way your career tells you to do it. It's not reality. Let's just look at reality. And I'm talking about this not as a Democrat. I'm talking about this as an historian, truly. And I can distinguish between the two. This is not an election. And, and, and I think that the sooner that people get over the fact that they would somehow seem partisan. This is not a partisan question now. It hasn't been. That's what this suit actually brings up on the 14th Amendment. This is not a partisan issue anymore. This is a, this is a question of democracy or anti-democracy. Now, I know everybody on the other side is going to say that I'm just another liberal who's trying to you know negate democracy. Nonsense. Nonsense. Any more than Abraham Lincoln was accused of overcoming democracy because he stood up to the secessionists. We have to stand up to them the same way that Lincoln stood up to the, to the secessionists. That's my view. It, and, okay, it, so I, what, what do we do? So we got to cover this. There's going to be a Republican convention. There's going to be a Democratic convention. Sure. There's going to be charges and counter charges. And what do we, so here we are. We're faced with this. The, the, the Republican Party is overwhelmingly nominated this man. It's the GOP. It's been around, what, am I right, 1856? The, yeah. The path, but there's the pathfinder. Yeah, so we just act like it doesn't happen. <laughs> no, but just but your point is to cover it not as the Republican Party for one thing. I know, I know, it's a hard thing to get people to try to to accept. I know, yeah, but it's very hard. I get it. But the fact is that a lot of this is just theater. It's Kabuki theater. It doesn't mean anything. Haley, Nikki Haley's candidate meant nothing except for Nikki Haley. She'll get a lot out of it in terms down the line. But but it's politically it means absolutely nothing. And and. And that's why this case is actually so important, okay? Because it's something else that's, that's at stake here. It's the Supreme Court. It's not just the legitimacy of the Republican Party, which to my view doesn't exist, but it's the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Because if you take their ruling judicial theory of originalism, right, that, that you have to go back to the original meaning of the Constitution as the framers understood it, as the framers of the amendments understood it, that's where you take, there's no question on originalist grounds that Donald Trump should be disqualified. I mean, it's, it's as clear as, as, as day that that's the only choice they have if they want to be originalists. So they have a choice, right? They can either disqualify Trump and stay true to their code, stay true to their theory, or they can shred their theory entirely and showing that it's completely nonsense. It's nonsense all along. That's the, that's the, 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 the problem that the majority on the, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court now faces. But, but, but the nice thing about this case, actually, and by the way, a case that was brought by two Federalist Society conservative lawyers, you know, these are not Democrats that are doing this on the basis of their understanding of the, they're originalists and they're holding the court to its originalist precepts and saying, you have to do this. I think they're right. But the court is now also um, facing its own, what should we say, it's a point of no return for them, I think. They have to decide to do what their own theory tells them they must do, or they have to admit that their, that theory all along has been just, you know, a lot of nonsense. So the the most followed historian in the United States is not John Lentz. It's not Eric Forner. It's not Heather Cox Richardson. It's not anybody that anyone listens to the show knows or heard of. It's David Barton. Yes. yes. All right. David Barton is the most paid attention to. Some would argue, in terms of influence, maybe the most influential historian of this era. Right. Would you mind just sharing with our viewers exactly who David Barton is and what exactly does he bring to the Academy? <laughs> <laughs> the Academy. Well, I, 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 my own I problem, love that word, the Academy. Uh, I have my own problems with the Academy, but that's another story. It's like asking um, you what look, Sean Hannity brings to journalism, but go ahead, Sean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. David Barton, I don't know that much about him, actually, James, except what he's, what he's written, which is that the United States is a Christian country and should be ruled by the Bible, basically, by the Christian uh, interpretation of the Bible, and that that's all you need to know. 
He's a Christian nationalist, and right. and 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 he, and he, he parades this fake history in the name of, of Christian nationalism. And you know, look. There have been people like that around all the time. It's just that the media now, social media and stuff, gives them a bigger platform than those people ever had in the past. But look, the Supreme Court doesn't have to, have to listen to, to David Barton. The Supreme Court can listen to, to me and Heather and and uh, who was it, Eric, and, you know, the real historian. Yeah. This is a sort of contest, actually. If you look at the amicus briefs that the right wings put up, or the sorry, the the that. Ted Cruz. There is more junk history in those amicus briefs than you, you know. I, I've ever, I, it's unbelievable to any to any real historian. So they can either listen to the real historians or to the fake historians. I, uh, you know what they'll choose, Sean. But anyway, go ahead, James. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I'm sorry because this is just an obsession of mine. All right, there was no more junk history than the lost cause in the Dunning School. Correct. It was all insane, but it was influential. Co correct. People believed that shit. Yep. All right? It was all, if you look back on it, you're like, oh, my God, how, how did we all, but that was for you go out. You know, Grant was a butcher, yep. and yep. they went too far. It wasn't and, about and slavery. It, 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 it wasn't about it was slavery. Slave. It was about trade. But that shit took hold, man. For a long, long time. I mean, look, I spent my, the generation just before me spent its entire career undoing all that crap. And, right. you know, it was very powerful from about the 1880s right through to the 1950s. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that happened. In some ways, it reflected what the country went through. The whole country made this, you know, uh, backed off from the promise of of, of, of abolition, of reconstruction, uh, made its its it made its peace with Jim Crow. I mean, that was a political thing, right, James? I mean, that was that was just happening, and 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 people wanted to believe all of this. Well, a lot of Southern historians came along, and I got to give the Southern historians credit. They 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 knew how to write, they knew how to do research, they knew how to put them to something over. Um, they managed to to reflect that. What should we say? Rejection of the ideals of the Civil War and of Reconstruction, and to make it into history, and it stuck for a very, very long time. But it, you know, it's where history and politics meet. I think around all of that, not for nothing, for example, that the law school school began to become undone by historians in the middle of the 1950s, right? Just when the Civil Rights Movement is breaking through Jim Jim Crow, that's when historians began to take the inspiration to to, to undo all of that old stuff. Um, but yeah, it lasts a long time. Now, will that be the case with David Barton? Is the history of the future de dependent upon David? Is going to be David Barton's school? Well, in some parts of the country, I suppose it's, that's inevitable. But a lot depends on this election. I mean, look, someone asked me, what's going to happen if Trump gets elected? How are historians going to cover the Trump election if he gets elected? And I said, well, I just hope there are historians after Trump gets elected. That's number one. But number two, it'll be the Hillsdale College version of American history, which is not that you know, it's a d different version of a David Barton school, but it'll be a respectable, you know, version of all of that. That'll become American history in 2024 will look like, the, you know, 1776 and the rest of us can all go to hell. That's that's where politics and history mesh. So I just wait for one comment and turn it back out. Thank God that I had T.R.A. Williams, who was the epitome of a Southern historian, yeah. who hated, and I had him in the early 60s, he hated these sons of bitches. He would say, talk about the little girl came home from Sunday school in Richmond in the 1930s. His mama was General Lee in the Old Testament or the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he was a quasi-religious figure. You had the, you had... You had the best with G. Harry, let me tell you. You you, you really, you know, lucked out. There were a bunch of Southern-born historians who ended up helping undo C. Van Woodward, my teacher at, at, at Yale, but but he was another one. There were there were some very, very good Southern historians who helped undo it, but it took a lot of undoing. You know, I would just now add it, to that, Sean, a personal note. My grandmother in Orange, Virginia, was a member, a, a wonderful, wonderful woman, but a member of the United mm -hmm. Daughters of the Confederacy, uh, had not only pictures of, we always call him General Lee, it was never Robert E. Lee, General Lee. He even had a picture of his horse, Traveler. Uh, and she would, you know, talk to me. She was a lost cause person about the Civil War and Lee's great generals. I mean, I had pictures as a 10-year-old of Jeb Stewart and Stonewall. Stonewall right. hadn't died, we'd have won the war. And right, you know right, something? Right. The one person she never mentioned was General Longstreet, 
who was Lee's most important commander. Uh, but the lost cause turned on him. Uh, anyway, it was, it's, it's fascinating. It sure did. Yeah. Well, Longstreet was a great man, and there's a new biography of him out that I commend to your yeah. listeners. Um, that's, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's that you should look at. It's a woman historian, Liz, is it? Liz Varon at, at, yeah. at UVA, and she's a very good historian, and it's a very good book. And it gets into, it's a little bit more about the memory of Longstreet. Never mind. It's a great book. I, I, I recommend it, as I recommend the memory of, of James Longstreet, who, who changed his mind. Yeah. The whole war horse. His second yeah. wife died in Mary in 1952. His other, his other right. great fame to fame is he went to the same school as my wife in Augusta, Georgia. But anyway. Oh, oh is that right? Yes. Richmond right. Academy. Very good. Sean, let me Very ask good. you this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even playing devil's advocate. I'm just going to give you the case that some of the people who don't much like Trump but say we exaggerate. And they say, yeah, he did a lot of harm in four years, but there were guardrails. The courts rejected some of his most extreme actions, notably his efforts to overturn the election. Congress rebuffed some. Um, some of his own appointees from <clears throat> Jim Mattis to John Kelly to Mark Milley <clears throat> stood up at times. You think it would be different in a second Trump term? Absolutely. Given the fact that he's already basically called for the death penalty for Mark Milley, <laughs> it's going to be different. It's kind of hard to stand up if you're in the gallows. <laughs> I mean, you know, look. I also recommend to your listeners that they go online and read the Heritage Foundation Project 2025 report. Okay, if they want to get a sense of what's coming, of what the second uh, uh, second Trump presidency would be like, look at that. It will it will curl your toenails. It, it is so scary what they intend to do, which is to basically void the federal bureaucracy, federal government. If anybody would stand up to Trump, put in his people, and and you know hell for leather after that. You know n nothing will stop them in doing all that they want to do. The, look, I'll give you one small example. As James well knows. Uh, the executive controls the Office of Legal Counsel, a thing called the Office of Le Legal Counsel inside the White House, which which determines what, you know, the, the boundaries of executive power are, what they are and what they aren't. And then people are always referring to the OLC. Well, he will pit, Donald Trump will be in charge of the OLC. Donald Trump will be writing his own ticket with his own lawyers. You think his lawyers are bad now? Look, at the, well, the ones he's going to put in are going to be really scary because they're going to have institutional power. No, I think the guardrails are off. What, if he gets reelected, we were very, very fortunate the first time around that that he didn't have that he had to learn how to do it, and he learned how to do it. He tried to do it on January sixth; it failed. Um, but he's not; he's got people. And by the way, it's not just Donald Trump; it's the people around him, and they're not stupid. I mean, Stephen Miller is not a stupid guy; he knows how to do all of this. So, so I say no to to, to all. I mean, I know. I, yeah, I get a, the same thing. I'm high. You know, I, I, I'm passionate. People say that I get too worked up. People say that I'm just, you know, exaggerating. Just read that stuff. That's all I can say. Read it quietly, and you'll see for yourself that what's looming here is not a, an administration you might not like. What's looming here is the death of the American Republic as we understand it. And 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 if you read, just read. Don't go by by what I'm saying. Just read the stuff. I think you'll you'll convince yourself. And I think it's going to come out more in the course of the campaign as well, because Trump can't help himself. But, you know, right now, it's all hands on deck. I mean, that's what I think we're up against. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, <clears throat> and I have read parts of that, and it's absolutely scary. Hey, he doesn't believe in the rule of law. I mean, you no, know, correct, correct. Nixon believed in the rule of law but thought you could fudge it. Uh, Trump just yeah. has no belief in the rule of law at all. And so that's have, have we ever seen anything like this at that level? Sean, somebody yeah. who committed these offenses uh, from Access Hollywood to John McCain to election to nine in January 6th. And time. Is there ever been anything like this at that level in American history? Well, no. I mean, you know, Access Hollywood, there been plenty of scandals in American history, yeah. many scandals, presidents, that's happened. But no, going January 6th is at another order. I mean, now we're talking about right. repudiating the Constitution of the United States. No president, the only president who repudiated the Constitution of the United States, the only American president who did that was named Jefferson Davis. Now, he was an American president of the Confederate States of America. Right. He repudiated the Constitution of the United States, and it came up with his own Constitution. They did, uh, which legitimized slavery, made slavery the core of the of, of of the government. Now, you know, Donald Trump and Jefferson Davis. You know, those are the two that I can think of that the two presidents I can think of who who, who match who would match each other in that respect. But not nobody else. Yeah, I mean, this did, well, look in eighteen sixty sixty one, right? Why did the South secede? 
The South seceded over slavery, to be sure, but they seceded over a presidential election. Right? They seceded. The South Carolinians said this. We are leaving because Abraham Lincoln just got elected president. We will not accept it. We're out of here. And then all the other, you know, the other, the other 10 states went with him. Now, that's the same thing that happened on January 6th. We are not going to accept a presidential election. You know, democracy does not rule. That's the parallel, I think, Al, in, in terms of what happened then and what happened now. And, and in the lead up to 1860, the 1850s, is there a parallel between mm-hmm. today and what was going on back in the 1850s? Absolutely. In the, in the 1850s, one political party died. Now, a good political party took its place. The Whig party died in the middle of the 1850s and the Republicans came along. Now, in this case, we have the death of a political party, the Republicans, and an absolute monster has come along to, to, to replace it. Not the Republican party of Abraham Lincoln, but the MAGA party of Donald yeah. Trump. That's what happens when, when the, when the, the conflicts of American um, life, American politics reach such a, a fever pitch. It's been building out for decades. It's been building since at least Newt Gingrich. We've talked about this actually on the air. Um, but right now, that's what's the, the only parallel in terms of the process is the 1850s. I think you're absolutely right. James. So, so Sean, the, the world knows you as a world-class historian, a chairman who's taught Princeton. You know, I, I know you as a world-class historian. I also know that you're a deeply informed and passionate citizen, and you watch things. Well, how do you, and I know it's hard to guess and everything, do you see any chance that the Supreme Court would, would uphold the Colorado ruling? And do you see that as a possibility under any circumstances? Yes. I mean, I wouldn't have written the thing that I wrote if I thought it was, I don't write things just to, <laughs> for the money. <laughs> just right for the back. money. No, no right. I, mean, I mean, I think, look, look, I, I, I do think so. Um, first of all, you do have three extraordinarily talented minority in the minority justices, including my former student, Elena Kagan, who I think is very persuasive and very powerful. That's number one. So there's, it's not as if you're you're dealing with, you know, nine right-wing judges. You're not. Secondly, I think that the case that I made earlier is pretty compelling on originalist grounds, you know, on the grounds that they have to, they have to think about their place in history too. I'm not so sure that Clarence Thomas and uh, Samuel, Samuel Alito care a fig about any of that. I do think, I do think that Barrett and Kavanaugh and maybe Gorsuch, but certainly Barrett, uh, um, Barrett and Kavanaugh, and then with Roberts trying to adjudicate all of this, actually do understand that they have a place in history, that history will judge us. Um, the fiery trial of history, as Abraham Lincoln put it. I, I think that that people, it's stranger things have happened. Let me put it that way, James, as, as both of you gentlemen know, stranger things have happened in American politics than what happened then. So I think there's still a possibility. I wouldn't want to bet on it. Um, um, but, you know, I do think there's a, such a compelling case here that um, it could even break through. Um, 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 all of my, what, in the know friends who study the court, they think I'm, I'm crazy, but I don't think I am. I think that, and, 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 and mind you, I'm not the only person who's written this stuff. 25 Civil War historians, including James McPherson, the greatest Civil War historian alive. Um, David Blight and Jill Lepore and others have come up with their own amicus briefs. There are amicus briefs out there like crazy. And Michael Ludig, that are who basically making the Michael point. Ludig may be yeah. the most prominent conservative uh, federal appeals court judge. Absolutely. <laughs> and look, M- Michael Ludig knows the law. And he understands the Constitution. And he understood January 6th as a revolutionary moment. And, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a raving left winger to figure this out. You know, it, it's plain as the, it, it's, as, it's as old as the scripture, as John F. Kennedy once said, it's as old as the scripture and as plain as the Constitution of the United States, what's going on here. And, you know, and so politics might overrun. Here's the, my last little point before I, before I stop is that at this point, all of these amicus briefs have more or less closed off any, any escape route that the, that the court might follow, the court majority might follow to, to leave him on the ticket. There's no way that they can get, they can come up with a rationale that's not going to look terrible. That's not going to be, you know, Dred Scott all over again. If they want to face that, that's fine. That's their, that's their, that's their choice. But they have to be aware that that's what they're facing. I am told, and I've read about it, that the Colorado Supreme Court case was actually well thought out. It wasn't just that, that they actually assigned pretty compelling reasons to do why they did what they did and mm-hmm. even anticipated a lot of the arguments that we're hearing today. Mm-hmm. 
And a lot of the arguments that this was a lot of the arguments here today actually come out of the Supreme Court that you know the Colorado ruling. I mean, it was a very very well reasoned piece of 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 you know a ruling. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, they took it very seriously, and as well, you know, they knew, they knew what was on the line. So, you know, there we are. Okay. Well, I, uh, Prof, I'll turn it back to Al. Is always uh, our all star guest, all star friend, all star historian, all star <laughs> commentator, and uh, all star patriot. Al, well, to you. I'd also say maybe I'd rather disagree with my wife <laughs> than Sean Malone. <laughs> 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 Sean, you are you are everything James said. You're a fabulous guest, and. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be back early and often in the course of this election. Well, let's let's certainly get back after the Supreme Court rules, one way or the we other. Will. We'll, we'll either be, either be <laughs> <laughs> talking talking crap or we'll Bucket. be uh, drinking champagne. I'm not sure which, but you know, but, let's do it. We're we're ready <laughs> for deal. it. Terrific. Take care. Very good. All right, gents. So long. I'm getting a stellar night sleep with stellar sleep. It's an integral part of the toolbox that you need to get a good night's sleep, which to me and most people that I talk to is the most determinative factor right. in how they feel the next day. So I, 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 I can't say this, this stuff is indispensable, and I would urge anybody that likes to have a good night's sleep and wants to do everything they can to assure it, this is a, this is a good Good, good tool to have in your toolbox. Well, you're right, because we all hate it when you're lying in bed for what feels like an eternity, tossing and turning, desperately trying to find the ideal position or coming up with games to play in your head. We used to have that every night, which is why we're so glad this podcast is sponsored by Stellar Sleep. If you have sleep problems, big or small, you need to try Stellar Sleep. Stellar Sleep revolutionizes how chronic insomnia is treating. Offered the very first digital solution to all your sleep issues. What makes Stellar Sleep unique is how their focus on sleep psychology helps you tackle your insomnia at the source instead of short-term solutions like medications or cutting back on caffeine. Stellar Sleep was founded at Harvard by best friends who were both chronic insomnia sufferers and were frustrated with a lack of resources available to help their condition. Since sleep clinics often have waiting lists of six to 12 months and are expensive and time consuming, they wanted to create something to benefit everyone. So many people rely on gimmicks or even just luck to get a good night's sleep. But using Stellar Sleep uses the latest science to give you the rest you need. After going through their behavioral therapy-based curriculum, it's been a total game changer. Uh, you know, you save so much time formerly wasting trying to fall asleep. And spouses are a lot happier if you're not tossing and turning all night. 80% of Stellar Sleep users significantly improve their sleep, falling asleep much quicker and staying asleep for 74 minutes longer. Oh, my gosh, how I used to want that 74 minutes. That's a big deal. So if you got stress, anxiety, or burnout, it's time to give Stellar Sleep a try. Learn how to sleep again with Stellar Sleep. Head to stellarsleep.com slash war room for your free seven-day trial, and then it's just $99 per year. Plus, you can cancel any time within the first 30 days for a full refund. Once again, that's stellarsleep.com slash war room for your free seven-day trial. Then just 99 bucks a year. Look for the link in our show notes. Hey, James and Dara Luxmanen, we were colleagues at Bloomberg, and she is one of the very best foreign policy analysts in Washington. Welcome, Indira. The Middle East stakes got even bigger uh, this past week when three Americans were killed by a drone strike that the U.S. believes uh, was sent by Iranian-backed militants. There is tremendous pressure on Biden for a forceful response. Senator Tom Cotton said outrageously, I think, otherwise it would be cowardly. But Biden also doesn't want to escalate uh, the tensions in this region, which could get inflamed quickly. Think World War I. How does he weigh those options? You know, Al, 
beyond the headlines, it's really interesting to talk to sources about what's going on behind the scenes. Because in fact, while Biden came out and said publicly, we will respond to this at a time and place and in a manner of our choosing, which is, of course, the standard response from a president. What we know has been going on behind the scenes is that Iran has been disavowing this and saying, we don't want to be dragged into a larger conflict. We don't want the United States to use this as a pretext for attacking us, even though we know these were uh, this was an Iran-backed group that did, you know, send this drone out that killed these three American service people, two of them women, by the way. Um, it seems that Iran has been behind the scenes pressuring uh, this group and telling them that they need to stop their attacks on the United States. And in fact, this militia, which is Iranian-backed and, um, you know, works out of Syria and Iraq, um, um, they're called Kataib Hezbollah. They're not the same as the Hezbollah based in Lebanon. They have actually come out yesterday and said that they will stop their attacks against U.S. targets. So no doubt they are facing pressure from Iran, even though they made a point of saying Iran doesn't know when we strike. They don't know what we're doing. We make all of our own decisions. So there's definitely pressure going on in the background to try to prevent this from you know, escalating even more to an all out conflagration throughout the region. Well, but Biden has to do something. That's right. And I think he will. But remember, this is a case where there have been about 170 attacks on U.S. forces since the right. October 7th attack um, by Hamas on Israel. And this is the first one that was fatal. Thank goodness there haven't been others that were fatal. It was inevitable that this would happen. Don't forget, the U.S. is already responding against the Houthi attacks at sea. Um, there are a lot of balls in the air. The U.S. is pressuring the Iraqi government to keep, you know, the U.S. bases and the some um, 2,500 U.S. troops that are in Iraq, despite the fact that the Iraqi president wants them out. So, you know, don't forget there are tens of thousands of American service people posted throughout the Middle East, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Djibouti, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, there are a lot of places where um, pressure could come down on the United States. And I think while President Biden will respond in some way, it may be um, an isolated response against this Kataib Hezbollah rather than a bigger response against Iran. And Dira, my guess is this isn't going to really de-escalate until the uh, Israel-Hamas war ends, however we call an end. That's what Biden wants. That's what some top Israeli officials want. World opinion has certainly turned against Israel since their response to Hamas's October 7th slaughter of Israeli citizens. But Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu seems to have little interest in that. The war is keeping Bibi in power. Uh, so what do you do? What, I, I saw where some of his right wing uh, said the other day that if you make some kind of a deal, uh, you know, we'll leave your coalition, which means you're gone. You're right, Al. I, you know, as much as when a president or a prime minister is on a war footing, he does have um, the nation behind him or her. That is true. At the same time, we know from all the polls, and we talked about this last time I was on, that BB is not popular at home. So he's trying to cling to power any way that he can. But you're also absolutely right that the only way out of this in the long run is a two-state solution. It's something that BB has said publicly he does not want, he will not pursue. It's something that Hamas has said. They are not planning on recognizing Israel. So both of these sides for this to resolve are going to have to stand down. And I think that the precursor to all of this, a prerequisite is there's going to have to be a different Israeli leader before we can look at a larger, wider peace. And Hamas is going to have to be convinced that there's something in it for them, that there is the possibility of a two-state solution before we can go to an actual peace in a post, you know, war situation after this Gaza conflict resolves. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. James. So, yeah, I'm like like movies, like the movie Gandhi. And Gandhi famously said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, leads the whole world to be toothless and blind. So, all right, we, they, three of our soldiers were, were, were killed by the, the, these criminal aligned, Iran aligned, whatever the fuck they are. But did anybody consider maybe we don't respond and use this to tell 
it, at some point, we got to stop this. At some point, Israel's got to understand what happened with Hamas. Get, is there any chance that someone is thinking, let, let's try to use this to get a, a, a different course? Because we, it's predictable Biden needs to do it. It's going to be a surgical strike. It's going to be covered for 12 hours in the press. And it's going to be like it never fucking happened. We all know that. And, I think you're right, James, that you know, if analysts were running the show, <laughs> that maybe calmer heads would right, prevail right. and people would say, hmm, let's right. think about what's good for the long run for peace and stability and resolution of this conflict rather than ramp- ramping it up. We also know that the reality is in every single country, um, and you know this from your time advising, um, you know, American president, right. that, you know, presidents are forced, leaders are forced to respond or they're considered weak. So I think we what Biden did that protects him is he says, we will respond at a time and a place and a manner of our choosing. You might not even know what that is. I mean, you'll remember that President Obama sometimes said the same thing. You may not know when we're coming and when we're going to do what we do. So it might be something that's more sub rosa. Um, I don't think that Biden or anyone in his administration has any interest in inflaming a conflict with Iran. And the very fact that within 24 hours, this Kataib Hezbollah group said last night, kind of uncle, oh, no, America, we're going to stop our attacks on you, shows that there is pressure going on behind the scenes to try to ramp down um, you know, this from getting out of control. I mean, we've already got all the bombings of the Houthis, right? We've already got that entire right. problem there at sea. So I don't think anyone in the Biden administration wants to make this worse. But there is a domestic audience, not to mention uh, the Gold Star families, the military families, um, who are another audience for the president, particularly in a, an election year. I, I, I understand. I mean, he's three young reservists were killed and they said, well, it, uh, their lives mean anything. All right. Would their lives mean more if we have some sur- surgical strike and blow 50 assholes out of the, in the air? Or would it mean more if we just, I don't know, just an idea. If we sort of took this as a way to say, okay, we all got a grievance here. We all got to like, I don't know. I'm going to ask you a question. In some, what was the word, the Abraham Accords? And what exactly was that? Give, give me some historical Yeah, you know, there here. were efforts, as you, you know, you know better than anybody because you've been so close to them, James. There have been so many efforts over the last 30 years um, to, to right. have peace in the Middle East, to have Israeli peace with governments beyond um, Egypt. And, you know, there have been many attempts that started across the Arab world, including the Saudi-led attempt, which I would say was the one that looked closest to something coming out of it. There have been a number of efforts um, over the last three decades to come up with a way to have Israel have peace beyond Egypt and Jordan. And, you know, I think, James, you have a closer vantage point than many do to, you know, why some of these failed or what were the domestic considerations, at least, that went into the U.S. pressing on these. Now, we know that the the Saudi-led efforts were the ones that in the last decade came closest to something that would work. Um, And then it all collapsed. And part of the reason that it collapsed is because Bibi Netanyahu, he did not want to have peace. Ultimately, he didn't want a two-state solution. And it's really interesting how just at the moment when it looked like there might actually be a Saudi-Israeli peace deal happening last fall, um, this Hamas attack happened, which a lot of people believe was done in part to uh, try to derail an um, Israeli-Saudi deal, which could be the beginning of, um, you know, a a larger and broader peace. The Abraham Accords, specifically to what you were asking about, were these bilateral Arab-Israeli normalization that was signed between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain back in 2020. And so the idea was that, you know, this was hosted by President Trump. This was supposed to be his big foray into peace in the Middle East. We know, obviously, that it didn't ultimately succeed. Um, But, you know, I'm reminded, James, of something that Hillary Clinton used to say to the press corps in the four years that we covered her as Secretary of State. She would always say, you don't make peace with your friends. And that's 
obviously the truth. And peace requires um, taking risks. It requires strong leadership. It requires compromise. It requires a leader who is willing to put his or her, you know, credibility on the line. And we saw that in a place like Northern Ireland. So I think that it's not impossible that there could be peace in the Middle East. But with the current leadership we have in the Middle East, I don't see someone like Benjamin Netanyahu wanting or willing to take the risks and make the compromise, nor would the current leadership of Hamas be willing to take the risks and the compromise. And there's the fundamental lack of trust here that is unfortunately, you know, as much of an impediment as a lack of strong leadership. So from what I know, the Abraham Accords, Jared was in the middle of it, the Saudis, the Bahrainians, the Qataris, just my Louisiana upbringing, this is a whorehouse deal. It's all about money, and they kept the Palestinians out of the equation, and they, let's just say they shoehorned their way back into the equation on October 7th and leave it at that. But, and we know that the Qataris were sending money to Gaza with the approval of the Israeli government. I, I will remain to this day without proof, suspicious that BB was not getting his cut. Excuse me for being cynical, but I, I, that's just the way that I am. But I just don't, somebody has got to get off of this hamster wheel, and I, I don't know how, how to do it, but I, I, maybe you have an idea or share something with us. How, how, how can this, and Ehud says, Ehud Brock says, 50 years from now, if there's peace in Israel, it's going to be, it's going to look just like what he and Bill Clinton came up with in 1999. There is no other way to do it. I think you're right that it's pretty basic. There has to be a two-state solution. And, you know, the fact that we are further away from a two-state solution today than we have been any time in the last few decades is not encouraging. Um, I like to look back to Northern Ireland because, remember, the IRA was certainly considered a terrorist group. Um, by most of the world, the fact that they were able to come to the table with British leaders, with Irish leaders, with the United States. I mean, another thing is you need an honest broker in the room, someone who is seen as being uh, neutral. The problem is the United States has wanted to be an honest broker in the Middle East, but for years it hasn't been seen that way. It's been seen as to, you know, as as completely on Israel's side. The question is, could Qatar step into the shoes and become the so-called honest broker? I don't know if that's possible. But I do know that in places like South Africa and Northern Ireland, where we never imagined that there would be peace, look what has happened. So, you know, there has to be uh, there has to be strong leadership and someone who takes risks. And this is a, a quote that I'm sure you'll remember, James, from the Good Friday Accords. Remember, there were leaders around the table who said that the key to these kinds of negotiations where you have to be able to let the other side stand up with his trousers still on. You know, everyone has to give and take, and you need to be able to let the other guy sell the deal to his home audience. So that's something where, you know, we're going to have to come to a place where some Palestinian leadership, and right now it doesn't look like it would be Hamas or the Palestinian Authority, given their corruption and entrenchment, et cetera, some Palestinian legitimate authority that hopefully would be voted on by the Palestinian people is going to have to be brave enough to make compromises and some Israeli leadership is going to have to be brave enough to make compromises. I'll turn it back to Albert just to note, Carvilles are all over County Monaghan. Mary and I try to go every September. We see every memorial. It was the middle of bandit country. I don't know how many relatives I had in the IRA, but it was more than one or two. And people are quite content living in peace. You would be surprised that you don't even know. You got to ask, hey, are we in the Republic of Ireland or are we in the UK? And it, what do you, what, what do you think back there? Oh, yeah, I think we're in the UK right now. I'm not sure. I mean, that, that That's just the way it is, all right? And it, it maybe it can happen somewhere else. Albert, go ahead. Uh, and, dear, I know uh, I don't want to keep you, but I want to ask you about one person who just fascinates me here, and that's Bill Burns. I think Bill Burns, I'm a huge admirer. Um, he's deeply involved in this. He was in Paris sitting down trying to draft a, a, a you know, some kind of a compromise. He's traveled to the Middle East countries. I can't recall a CIA director 
playing this prominent a role, at least in my memory? Well, you make a really good point about Bill Burns' role. Part of the reason that he's out there out front is, remember, he came up not through the intelligence services, but through the State Department. And he was a very well-respected and beloved Deputy Secretary of State and also a very well-respected um, ambassador in various key points. He was, of course, ambassador in Russia. And um, among the many officials who I met when I was on the State Department beat, he always struck me as he's one of those low talkers. You have to get, rather than grandstanding, like some officials do, he's very soft-spoken. Um, and you have to get right up next to him to be able to hear what the man is saying. When you do, it's always worth it. And again, I would make a comparison to Northern Ireland, which is, remember, the talk, which was a secret conversation that took place years before the Good Friday Accords. The one that broke the ice was one between um, officials from MI5 and MI6 meeting with members of the IRA and Irish officials, Northern Irish officials. That was what broke the ice. So it's not unusual for it to be members of spy services, intelligence services, to be the ones who have the most information, who really can be the ones who make a breakthrough um, in the piece. So that's another interesting parallel I noticed. Well, we couldn't do better than uh, Bill Burns. Uh, uh, Indira, you've been a great guest. Uh, We love having you on. We learn a lot, don't we, James? But I'm just, um, you know, I'm such a huge fan. I, I guess it's NPR. I just think you're, you're concision and the combination of knowledge and the ability to be concise is is a rare, rare quality. And let me tell you, you have it, girl. You have it. Oh, well, you thank really you got so it. much, you really gentlemen. Got it. I will be on NPR hosting <laughs> this Friday on February 2nd from 10 to 12 on 1A. So Okay, everybody in. listen to that. Uh, James, I think she's great on NPR. I think she may even be better on Politics War Room. That <laughs> but, uh, we love having her. We, 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 we love having her. We'll be back. Take care. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you gentlemen. Great to talk to you. There's somebody at Naked Wines that actually tastes this stuff. I know that. And there's nothing wrong with these huge, you, you know, people that make a lot of wine. I'm not criticizing anybody. But what I'm telling you, they find people that, that you, you wouldn't ordinarily come across. And you get good variety. You know, it's kind of fun. Wine is an integral part of life. It's an integral part of socializing. It's an integral part of families. It's an integral part of dining. And the fact that you have people that are finding these kinds of wines, you know, and you're right. And I was right. You go in a wine store and you look at it back and what about the, oh, that's an independent producer, which right adjacent to this vineyard, but he gets this much sunlight at this time of day and, and that kind of shit. These guys ferret the stuff out. They get a bargain. What they send you is going to be some 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 really good juice. That's what we call it, juice. The, and the juice there is good. It's affordable. It's conducive to conversation. It's just it's just, it's good juice. That's a high compliment yeah. in this business. Yeah. Now this podcast is sponsored by Naked Wines, a subscription service that seamlessly connects you to the finest independent winemakers on the planet. With Naked Wines, you get a box filled with the market's best quality wines whenever you like for a fraction of the price you'd normally pay in stores. Now, how do they do it? Naked Wines connects winemakers and wine drinkers directly, giving you vineyard to your door delivery at up to 60% off of store prices. By cutting out the traditional retail middleman cost and markups, winemakers pass those savings on to you without skimping on quality. As a result, you'll get exclusive access to hundreds of top quality award-winning wines at a huge savings. It's perfect for any wine drinker. Now, James and I have always hated going to the store and being paralyzed by the wine options and prices and, you know, where what's the best Italian this and the best California Chardonnay. It's, it's luck of the draw sometimes. Now we get exactly what you want. We know we're getting quality wines and ditch road trips to the store for good. Naked Wines helps you take any dinner to the next level with a perfect bottle for any occasion. Thanks to Naked Wines... Uh, you can enjoy an amazing steak dinner paired with a 2021 Matt Paris Reserve Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. It is one to remember. And the best part, every bottle is a passion project from an independent winemaker. 
So you are literally making an independent winemaker's dreams come true. There's no commitments or membership, and it's hassle-free. So head to nakedwines.com slash warroom and click enter voucher in the top right. Let's click enter voucher in the top right. When you get to the website, put in War Room for both the code and password to get six bottles of wine for just $39.99 with shipping included. That's $100 off and less than the $7 per bottle. That's nakedwines.com slash war room. Nakedwines.com slash war room and use the code and password war room. And grab six bottles for just $39.99. Nakedwines.com slash war room. Code and password war room for a hundred bucks off your first six bottles. You also can find the link in our show notes. Hey, now for the outrage of the week. James, we saw two terrific football games last weekend. And the Kansas City-San Francisco Super Bowl has all the elements of another great one. So what are, a, you know, a couple football purists, but mainly the right wingers, including Fox News and led, of course, by Donald Trump talking about. They're criticizing Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift for distracting from the game and her boyfriend, Chiefs tight end, Travis Kelsey. Uh, Trump apparently said, I'm more popular than she is. And so he resents her popularity because he's probably not. And his crazy, what's his name, Vivek Ramaswamy, one of the f- well, most foolish people ever running for the president, weighed in on it too. Now, look, I'm too old to be a Swifty, but she is one fabulous entertainer. She attends Kelsey's football games, including last weekend in Baltimore, enthusiastic and shows no signs of arrogance or elitism. The custodians at those games talk about her kindness and generosity, leaving huge tips. And by the way, she increases the viewership uh, for these games. As for a distraction, she was shown cheering in the Chiefs box last Sunday for a total of 25 seconds during a three-hour game. And she sure didn't distract her significant other, Travis Kelsey, who broke all who broke the all-time NFL playoff receiving record last weekend and leading his team to victory. I hope Taylor Swift, who's going to go on tour next week in Asia, will be able to get back for the Super Bowl and that her right-wing critics will get some kind of a life. And James, you know, maybe with a little help, even given our advanced age, we could become Swifties. I don't, <laughs> you know, I, she seems, uh, he's a football player. She, people have a right to date who they want. I, I find it kind of fascinating. I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't name one of the songs. I'm sure she doesn't really care. Uh, I'm, uh, it just, it's just the evidence of how insane they are. For my outrage, and this is something that I think, believe, and if you look at my YouTube channel from my very first lecture, and go to the Daily Beast, which is actually a pretty good place, and a guy named Roger Solinger, he's written a bunch of breaking news stories about <clears throat> the Christian nationalist movement and their tie to Mike Johnson. People have no idea what this is. They have, we're going to talk to a little bit to, with Professor Willis about this. They have no idea of how dangerous this is, and they have no idea of how close they are to setting government policy. Right? This is some of the craziest shit that you never heard of. This, this is, basically says that uh, Jesus gave uh, James Madison the Constitution, and it was all written for, for the protection of Christians. It's so far out there. And they all pimp money. A lot of shit comes out of Louisiana, a whole lot. The National Policy Council, look at how much money they're sitting on. All right, read Mr. Solinger's story. And, of course, if Trump gets in there, they have – all of the resources, you know, Leonard Leo has a billion fucking dollars, a billion dollars. Yeah. All right. That's all the same stuff. 
It's all the same stuff. And and now they're going through it. I think they call it Schedule 5, where they, they're having these plans, where the, the Christian nationalists, the heritage, some goofy right-wing thing, is already scouring people to put them all in the government. Right now, if the election was held today, Trump would be a favorite. He wins and this is going to become the policy of the United States. And you have to read this. You have to. And it, the, the Times and the Post, they don't fucking know. All right. If we're waiting on them to tell us this, they have no idea of how powerful, how financed, and how deep this whole dominionism, it's all the same stuff, Christian nationalism, Russia's Rush Dooney, you know, crazy these people are. And they are no less than a 45% chance that they're going to be all over the federal government. And, and, and Trump don't care. They'll, they'll say, you can steal all you want and you can amass all the power you want and we'll just run the mm -hmm. government. Trump don't care. And these are all going to be people that are going to be loyal to you, sir. Great. Come, and then they're going to take to it over. come to the semi-defense of the New York Times, the great Tom Etzel uh, has written very, very powerfully and persuasively uh, about this. But there hasn't been enough coverage. Uh, you know, I agree. But you if, can certainly, if anybody out you there, y'all are well read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know. They don't know. And they don't know how deep this is. They don't know how nutty it is. They don't know how rich these people are, and you know how it, how how the whole thing, and, and you know when you it's everywhere. And they're coming, they're coming, they're coming, and they're going to destroy the freaking country. And now, James, for the always great questions we get from our listeners, Tim in Bartlett, Illinois, what does President Biden need to do specifically in order to increase black and Hispanic voter enthusiasm and turnout for the general election? Oh, my God. I can't. That, that, you, you can't ask a better question. You can't ask a question that I have not talked to more people about or thought about more. Uh it's been horrific uh, since the 2020 election. And I, I suspect that at some point that people are going to have to realize that there is something to lose here. There is something to lose. And, and if you, Joe Biden has been demonstrably, I think, better than, than, than my hero Bill Clinton, better than Obama, the first black president. If you look at the differential in, in black employment numbers, that they, they that they're as low as they've ever been. If you look at the, his government, but you, you've got to convince people who feel alienated from the system that they have something to lose here. And so far, I'll be honest, it's a great question. I wish I had a better answer, but I, I, I haven't seen anything yet. That I've seen a lot of people work on this. A lot of people try. I've seen very little that actually works. And it is a, it's a hell of a question. I just wish I had a better Boy, answer I, for you. I feel the same way. It is so, it's critical. It's central to this election. Uh, you know, I think they ought to use I know, some, a few handful of sports figures or entertainers, but that only helps in the margins. But uh, it's a, it's a big challenge. Yeah, you gotta, but you gotta, yeah, you, you, do. look, you gotta try something. And, and you know everything that people have tried, and they've tried, uh, uh, they've tried peer-to-peer -peer contacts. They've tried all kinds of unconventional things, and the, just a lot of people, you know, blacks, uh, like you, you know, non uh, young people, they've become disconnected from this system, and there's so much to lose here. There's so much at stake. And so far, I, too many people don't realize where it is. But it, we got to keep trying. But thank you for the question. I don't have a great answer for it, but 
in defense of myself, uh, I hadn't yeah. talked to anybody else that has a great I answer agree. for it either, but keep asking. Joe in Westchester County, New York. The Biden campaign's successful strategy in 2020 was to go all in on the crucial states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Should this be the same strategy for 24 and spend less resources and time in Arizona and Georgia? Look, uh, if Joe Biden can't win Michigan, Pennsylvania, and probably Wisconsin, he's not going to win. Uh, I think Georgia is a really tough slog right now. Doesn't have Raphael Warnock on the ticket. I saw where that Stacey Abrams uh, voting group for blacks just uh, uh, went defunct. Uh, I I think Arizona, though, is winnable. I think, you you know, it's it's not going to be easy. The border doesn't make it any easy. But the Arizona Republican Party, you know, is having just a hugely bitter civil war. And uh, if Ruben uh, Gallegos proves to be a good candidate, doesn't get caught up with left-wing stuff like Medicare for all, uh, I think Wisconsin, I think Arizona is a place that I would invest some time. Uh, I just point out in 2022, with both Stacey Abrams and Warren Huckle and Ticket, black turnout wasn't that great. It, 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 you know, we had famously we had Sherry Beasley in North Carolina. It wasn't that great. I'm, I'm not saying we should don't uh, Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin. It wasn't that great. What it, it, this has become such a problem, and people thought I probably thought myself, you know, if we had more black candidates. But there's right now not much of a coalition between having black candidates and black turnout. It, there's there's a, something that's really, really missing here. Now, it, it, what, what Georgia and Arizona do, and I, I would agree with you, it looks like Arizona might be somewhat more promising. You got to compete in these two because right now we're not doing very well in Michigan. We're getting hurt by, you know, the, the, the our American vote in Michigan is pretty critical of Democrats and the events in the Middle East are really hurting us. So of course, we have to concentrate on those three states, but Arizona and Georgia both have fell out of electoral votes. They can allow you to lose one. It's a safety. It's a safety net. And you, you, you did, then they're raising money hand over foot. There's not a lack of resources, or anything. But I think you got to go, you know, balls to the wall on all five. Yeah, of them. I agree. Um, the next question uh, comes from Arthur in Washington, D.C. This is such a Washington, D.C. question, James. He said, what do you think of the notion that oh, Jamie great. Dimon has already been offered Secretary of the Treasury by Donald Trump? <laughs> I don't think much of it. I, I mean, and I don't know. I, I think Jamie, and I know him, known him for some time. I can't tell you, like, I hang out with him. And, uh, but but no, I, I think the guy had altitude sickness. Because the one thing that we know is not only could not Donald Trump be hired by H.R. or J.P. Morgan, he couldn't even be hired by an outside contractor. Right? Suppose He couldn't be hired by the landscape company. He couldn't be hired by the janitorial contractor for J.P. Morgan. And, uh, and again, it's this whole normalization of this. And, well, you got to admit, you know, Roger Lowenstein, his people have been aggrieved. They got a point. You know, no, this is not at all normal. And, by the way, a lot of people that Trump has said that he's helped have been have done, you know, slightly better as a result of, of Joe Biden's policies. But uh, they wouldn't hire. Trump could not get hired anywhere, any company, any place in the United States. You're an adjudicated rapist. You, you can't work there. If, if you are adjudicated business fraud, who, no one's going to hire you. They, they, and you, you're exposed to every lawsuit in the world if you did. This is not normal. This is not, but on the other hand, for God's sakes, I don't care where you're from. That's where we are. I think Jamie Dimon made a, you know, kind of a foolish mistake at Davos when he talked about, you know, Trump as, you know, was an all right president. Uh, But um, 
I think Jamie Dimon, if offered, and I don't think it ever would be offered, would never take it. Uh, you know, he knows enough to know what it's like to work for Trump, and you have to become a, a, a sycophant. And I don't think Jamie Dimon's going to do that. One call with so, Gary Cohn yeah. would debase him of any idea. Taking Sam that job. in Moscow, Idaho, says we've heard a lot of the Israeli perspective from you two. Are you worried that you've fallen victim to propaganda? This seems like a time for both sides. Sam, I don't think we've fallen victim. I think we both had the view that after October 7th, it was outrageous and the Israelis had to respond. Uh, and I had to respond massively, and they did. I think at this stage, at least my view is uh, that we that it's time for a, 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 a ceasefire. It's time for an exchange of hostages. It's time to start talking about a two-state solution. But as Indira said, Indira Lakshmanan said earlier, uh, that's very hard with the current leadership of Hamas and uh, uh, and Bibi Netanyahu, but uh, I, I I think it's uh, I think the Israelis uh, are you know have to think about the fact that they can't they can't be totally at odds with what really is almost universal uh, world opinion now. I think the world was by and large with them uh, after October seventh and a feeling okay you know it's time to pull back now. Well, it, 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 again. If if everybody thinks you got to do something, that's a time, but you probably ought to think about doing it, right? And I guess you know you say, well, they had to respond. Of course, I, my view, and we talked about this in your, it all started with the Abraham Accords, which was, I think, a whorehouse backdoor deal for everybody to make a bunch of money that that cut the Palestinians out, just did. And so now we're where we are, and, you know, they're, they're attacking our people, the Houthis in the Gulf of Oman or whatever it is. And at some point, somebody has got to try to figure a way to get off of the inevitable doom loop that we're in. And that, that's a very difficult question, but somebody's got to, I don't know what it is, think outside the box or some whatever shit people say. But it, it's just so depressing that you just see the same thing over and over and over and over again. So hopefully, you know, President Nick Burns is highly Burns, respected right. uh, diplomat, Bill, Bill, Bill Burns. I mean, it, it highly respected experience and brings a lot to the table. Shit, maybe he can think yeah. of something. But we got to think of something. Agree, Daniel in, in New Orleans, James, rightfully goes okay. to you. He said, I've heard James talk about beating Donald Trump by mocking him and calling him out. Two words evangelicals in the far right love to use is sick and evil. Why don't more Democrats and pundits use those words when referring to Donald Trump? Because if you grow up and you know, it's just kind of a norm, just that's a big word. You know, it have to be norms, and they were kind of norms in politics. And, and you didn't talk about people's body odor, all right? You didn't talk about their relationships with their spouses. All right. You didn't you stayed away from talking about people's children. All right. There's every norm that I knew that I grew up with, that I was part of politics, has just been blown up and shattered. It just it just it, it, it there's nothing left to pick up. And in in less than until people can free themselves, extricate themselves from the old norms from the old guardrails, from the old kind of unwritten rules of politics that we all grew up with, that we all have in our formative years and our careers, they don't exist no anymore. And you've got to be willing to throw all of this out. You have to be willing to use not very nice language. Uh, and you have to tell them, because you're trying to knock some of the people that are for him to show what a buffoon and hypocrite and criminal and predator and all of the other stuff that Donald Trump is, you, you just have to call them out and you got to forget about everything that you learned about being nice and polite and respectful and what's on limits and what's off limits. It's just, it's gone. It's done. It's over. Bye. Maybe we'll get it back, but 
not not between now and November, we're not going to get it back. Andy in Los Angeles says, what's up with Mitch McConnell? Seems like he's lost control of his caucus and can't get the votes on things he really cares about. What's his shelf life in the next Congress? Andy, you're right. Uh, I think he's got, I think Mitch has more problems with that caucus than he's had during his entire leadership. And the ultimate test is this Ukraine border uh, deal that Jim Langford and others are trying to get through. He cares deeply about aid to Ukraine. And uh, this is just a test where they've got to come up with something where he can supply at least a dozen uh, or so votes. And uh, I'm not sure he can do it. It's a real challenge. As for his shelf life, two, there, there, there are two ways I know Mitch McConnell will not be the Republican leader in his last two years. If number one, they stay in the minority, they'll look for someone else. Or number two, if Donald Trump is elected president. Uh, you know, they hate each other and there's no way he can serve then. So my guess is that uh, Mitch McConnell will spend two more years as a, not a backbencher, he'll still be influential because he's smart, but uh, you know, he, he can't be a happy warrior right now. You know, I'd don't, you know, like Mr. McConnell as much as the next person that like Mr. McConnell. He, he said, go to his caucus. And he said, I need your vote. He's, and the guy says, Mitch, I vote for this. There's no chance it's going to pass the House. I'm going to get clobbered in the primary. I mean, don't ask me to do this. If you said it's for the good of the country, I'm just going to assume for assumption, just because I, I, I don't have much evidence this is true, but there are some Republicans, maybe like Senator Lankford, that like actually care about the country. And if, and if, I, if Senator Lankford said, uh, if I was his, you know, advisor, and said, uh, Senator McConnell came, says, I think I should vote for this. It's really, I, I fundamentally believe this is good for the country, this is good policy. And I say, Senator, there's no chance these jackasses in the House are going to come anywhere near this. So why are you sticking your ass out to do something that at the end of the day has no chance to win? And that's what McConnell is up against. This reason has got, it in, well, I'll get you a bridge or I'll get you a, you know, it, 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 it's all blown up. It's all Clay Higgins and Trip, Chip Roy and, you know. Lauren Bobert, I'm sorry. This is just where it is. And, yeah. and, and in terms of villainous people, you know, five years ago, I'd have said Mitch McConnell is at the very top Hall of Fame villain. Nice. It's a 211 hitter. Reggie in Atlanta, Georgia. What happens if after Biden wins the Democratic nomination, and he's unable to run in the general election, health issue or something. Will Kamala Harris become the de facto presidential candidate, or will the DNC step in? I, remember we had Elaine yeah. Carmack on the show, who's the, the expert. I think what happens at some point, and this is kind of scary, I think the DNC, the, the that, that they picked the person. That's right. They, if, 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 if you drop dead two days before the election, you still have a candidate. There's, right. there's a it's a system there, and I, I can't recall every little detail with it, but there becomes a point, and I think it's after you're nominated, that if you become incapacitated, there is a protocol. There so, is. And if, there is. And if you knew the average, <laughs> I don't know if it could do much worse, but <laughs> it's a scary thought. But you know what? It's not, it's, it's, not, it's a very pertinent question. It's, not a, it, it's a definitely something to think about. Not maybe some good journalist uh, will, will explain, you know, through, you know, what happens if by this date, this, by that date, that. Uh, I think it'd be something that would be very valuable. Maybe Elaine could do like a piece explaining well, that. She I don't probably know. has. The, you know, the dates are yeah. certainly critical. Maybe Two does. days before the election. I don't know. It's probably too late. But there is a precedent. But, 1972. Um, Tom Eagleton, who was nominated by the convention to be the vice president uh, after it came out that he had, had taken uh, some electrical shock treatment uh, for uh, some problems, uh, he had to get off the ticket. And, and the, DN now, the DNC went along with McGovern's choice, so it's different in that sense. But, yeah, the DNC would then would then pick the uh, the candidate. Not, Wasn't he from Missouri? He yeah. That's my new. That's my new favorite. He was actually a, he was actually a pretty good guy. This was, that was an unfortunate. You know, uh, James Symington, 
uh, he was under Ken Burns. I watch that a lot. He was pretty pretty articulate guy, yeah. man. He was good. Yeah, and his father Stewart was a real heavyweight. Jack Kennedy thought he might be his most serious contender in 1960. Right, right, so, right. He was a big time right. senator from Missouri. Okay, that, keep those. Then we got Josh Howley. Play, yeah, exactly. But don't forget, <laughs> you know, at least Bill Bradley was born there. By the way, I want to just recommend to all of our listeners out there uh, on HBO get rolling along. Uh, Bill Bradley's life story. A one, he really does a Hal Holbrook. Uh, it's a one person uh, play, which is now on film, and it is great. You will love it. So anyway, James, I want. Everyone to keep those questions coming in because we love them, uh, and we'll get to them. If we didn't get to them this week, one of yours, we'll get to it next week. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville, and I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you'd check out the links to our sponsors, Songfinch, Stellar Sleep, and Naked Wines in our episode show notes. And we really thank you for supporting them because when you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. You also can find other shows you might enjoy on the Politicon YouTube channel or when you search Politicon on your favorite podcast sites. And remember, please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning. Passion filled politics and coverage. You share your trusted knowledge in the politics war room. Uncle James and Al. He's grown this stuff into a tight-knit family. Through the podcast time we cherish spent on Riverside. You've talked to people that you love and some you hate. You bring your best and stay to just debate You fought to overcome the new technology Crack and smiles and laughs with the humorous jokes you make If everybody listened to your wisdom then the world would be a better more intelligent place Over 40 Politics and coverage You share your trusted knowledge In the politics war room Uncle James and Al You've grown this staff Into a tight